It's with a lot of excitement and uh, anticipation that uh, we speak with you today. Um, Neil, Kurt, myself are um, really wanting to share with you some case studies, some, some real practical uh, applications associated with green infrastructure. Um, what a great conference, and uh, Larry Seltzer, uh, I think, set the, set the table for uh, this meeting in a wonderful way. What's being done in green infrastructure is something I want to talk about from um, a linear corridor company, company that goes across the landscape, and really what can be done, um, it's not simple, and you're going to see some of the engagement uh, in the short presentation that I have uh, to share with you this morning. What we're going to do in a way of logistics, um, I'll be talking to you a little about our multi-species habitat conservation plan. Um, then uh, we'll have Neil uh, Peterson come up, and uh, Neil will be uh, uh, speaking to you about uh, Maryland State Highway projects, uh, and then uh, Kurt uh, uh, Nagel will come up and talk about some things going on with water issues and ports and, and that kind of thing. So a broad array. Um, we'll take Q&A at the end, if that's okay. Um, prefer to do that rather than kind of stop and and then uh, we might get sidetracked. So the use of green infrastructure um, over the last decade um, has been something, Larry kind of took us all the way back in the 60s uh, and brought us forward. Um, back in that era, uh, we were doing some things in the pipeline industry it was not vogue to do, not really kosher to do. Uh, a lot of skepticism by the environmental community because most of the things that we were doing was by prescription by regulatory uh, act, and uh, for those of us who went out on a limb uh, and began to do some things in an innovative way, um, there was a lot of skepticism. Um, better today is we built some trust and can show that uh, we're really serious about being sustainable and bringing uh, uh, these kind of values to the table. Half of the last decade I've spent on this project that's before you uh, began in 2005. This journey actually in the Bloomington field office, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, went in, uh, a couple of us from NISource went in and asked the field supervisor a, a question about doing a habitat conservation plan for about five to seven species we're having a lot of permitting issues with. That discussion was quite interesting because um, Scott Pruitt, the field supervisor there, said uh, he said back to us across the table, "Why don't you um, why don't you think about doing one for all your endangered species?" And I, you know, <laughs> I thought, well, I don't know what he's been smoking, but you know, I'm not smoking that. How would I ever get that done? Uh, Sixteen thousand miles of right away and all the issues that surround uh, species uh, of that magnitude. Well, NISORS, we went there with the, uh, the question in our mind and our heart was, can we actually find a better way? Is a prescriptive way the only way? Is there a different way we can deal with these endangered species on a broader landscape scale? Can we actually develop our best management practices to the point uh, and bring better conservation to the table along with our impacts on the landscape to, to raise the value, to bring higher value. Um, it, it led us to that sit down with them and it's been uh, this, uh, this five year journey. We um, uh, always looking for different values and um, uh, you know all of the things that you see on this slide are some things that we were after as we went into this process. And what's really, um, really cool about this whole thing is um, we've been able to do this without amending the ESA. When I was at the White House in 1993, one of the issues we were looking at was um, critical habitat and trying to bring the ESA up and amend it. And every time it comes up, there's all sorts and types of issues. But I don't know that we need to go there. And uh, you're going to see some values that uh, we brought to the table. We have um, 
three fish and wildlife regions involved in this multi-species habitat conservation plan, no one has ever approached the landscape this magnitude. Now, Pacific Gas and Electric has one out in California that's multi-species, multi-county, but not multi-state. We have all 14 states um, in collaboration with us and have been for about three years now, three of the five. We have uh, 15 to 16,000 miles of right-of-way involved, uh, linear miles with a mile-wide corridor centered over our facility for ESA clearance. So hopefully when we obtain our incidental take permit, we will have coverage for the covered lands and covered activities within that area and be able to, to perform those activities um, and um, then conserve um, and mitigate as we go. Um, the business case, why are we at the table? These are the values. We're a Fortune 500 company. We have power generation facilities. We distribute electric. Uh, we also uh, distribute natural gas through 10 distribution companies in multi-states. Uh, so we actually drop it off to consumers, biscuit cookers. We also have high pressure natural gas transmission. It flows from the Gulf of Mexico, you saw on the map, all the way up to close to Maine. So we're in all facets and we look for these values. In order to get a private entity to the table, we want predictability and, and assurance and efficiency and progress. These are sustainable values for our stakeholders and the company, our shareholders, as well as our stakeholders of communities that we serve. Some of the benefits, the overall benefits for NYSORS was ho uh, that we're hoping to achieve with the multi-species plan is basically proactive rather than prescriptive and reactive or defensive. We like to play on the offensive side. And that is to uh, understand uh, the landscape in a broader scale, a broader way. Um, be able to um, approach landowners, communities, um, the local, entities, uh, states, and other, and federal commissions, which are federally regulated, um, with um, really a more proactive approach. The MSHCP enables us to do that. The timing, uh, just being able to efficiently respond to energy needs. If we're able to obtain this permit, we will be able to move more efficiency, at least for our, our impacts on endangered species. We'll be able to, we understand now more about minimizing and more about avoiding. So we're first in our plan going to avoid and minimize and then mitigate is the last circumstance. Um, it, it's an incredible journey and it's not one that's easily told in a few minutes, but hopefully you're, you're getting uh, the idea that this is um, something long-term that NYSource is looking for. We're going to ask Fish and Wildlife Service uh, for a 50-year permit. It will bring longevity to the conservation projects uh, that we undertake. It'll bring longevity to uh, the landscape. Uh, we will be able to put things in place and observe those and monitor those for years um, and check the value of what we're doing. Uh, we have adaptive management all wrapped into our plan. Uh, so we can make adjustments to it that, that we need to make. Some things may not work like we think they will work as efficiently. We will adapt and change and move to something that then we might think will work better. We're looking for improved uh, stakeholder engagement with this and really just consistent reviews and strategies from uh, all the regions of Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we were faced, for instance, with the Indiana bat, different protocols in different states with different field offices for Indiana bats. Uh, we were having difficulties with our consultants and some of our internal uh, biologists with, well, what do we do here? We don't know for sure what the protocol is. All of that now is more systemic, more organized. It just makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> 